It's not often that scientists get the chance to take a piece of Australian history into the lab. But that's exactly what's happened to the suit of armour worn by Joe Byrne from the Kelly Gang. And now there's a new theory about how the famous armour was made. Paul Willis begins his report in the town of Glenrowan. This is the start of an amazing journey of discovery. Inside this armoured van is one of Australia's most famous icons, a priceless suit of armour worn by one of the Kelly gang during the siege of Glenrowan. But the armour is surrounded in mysteries. No one knows for sure how it was made or who made it. So tomorrow morning it's being taken to the nuclear reactor in Sydney where it will undergo the most rigorous scientific testing it's ever had. But first, Rupert Hammond, the owner of the armour, is bringing it back to Glen Rowan to mark the 123rd anniversary of the siege. What we've got in there is the Joe Burns suit of armour and the reason why it's in the pack saddles is that that's the way it arrived here in Glen Rowan 123 years ago. Right now, spirits are high and the armour is taking pride of place in the celebrations. But this event also commemorates the demise of the Kelly Gang and tonight their descendants are here. Uh, my great-grandmother was Ned's younger sister, Grace. And to think that yeah, Ned was standing beside this armour amongst the hail of bullets 120 odd years ago is, yeah, it is very eerie stuff. But the owner of the armour, Rupert Hammond, is not a descendant of the Kelly Gang. Ironically, he's a descendant of Superintendent Hare, the boss of police at the time of the siege. 123 years, his family and mine were on other sides, and great to come back and be able to share the relationship one with the other. So that's and it's good. not just family attending this event. In Glen Rowan, Kelly Gang enthusiasts are knee deep. I always liked tattoos too, so as I got older and that, like, I just decided one day that I'd dedicate my right leg to the gang and now I've got a full leg of um, work done on the This armour belonged to Joe Byrne, Ned Kelly's second in command. He was only 23 years old when he was shot dead at the siege of Glen Rowan. Joe opposed the idea of the armour. We know from a policeman who overheard Joe and Ned talking, you know, in the midst of fighting. Uh, he heard Joe say to Ned, I always said this bloody armour would bring us to grief. But 123 years later, the big question about the armour is how was it made? Was it made by a professional blacksmith or by the amateur Kelly gang out in the bush? In Glen Rowan, almost everybody seems to think it was made by a blacksmith. Oh, it was definitely made by blacksmiths in some fairly discreet locations. Well, they couldn't really do it in the public gaze, could they? You couldn't get it hot enough out in the bush to make it. You had to do it at a proper forge. They're backed up by the famous Kelly historian, Ian Jones. I'd be very surprised if anything came out that suggested it wasn't made by an expert blacksmith. I mean, you look at it, it is a beautiful artefact. We only found one man who thought different. His name is Ned. He believes his great-grandfather helped make the armour and it was done out in the bush. My great-grandfather was Ned's first cousin and the story that's come down through my line is that they shaped it on a, on a stringy bark log, like had the thing in the water to dull the sound and they made a, a, a bush, bush forge and they went to work on it. Everyone does seem to agree that the armour was made from steel ploughshares like these, taken from neighbouring farms or donated to the Kellys by their supporters. But the key to finding out who made the armour lies in the temperature that the metal was heated to. A professional blacksmith uses a charcoal fire and bellows to heat the steel to yellow hot. That's over 1,000 degrees Celsius before shaping it. A normal bushfire has a much lower temperature and would only be able to get the metal to cherry red or 750 degrees. At this temperature, it's a lot harder to shape. So can science finally prove how the armour was made? 
The next morning, the armour is dismantled, ready for its journey down to the nuclear reactor in Sydney to solve the puzzle. From his birthplace here in Glen Rowan up to Lucas Heights. And there what we're going to try and do is find out just how he was made, what he's made out of. Let him tell his story. To Rupert, the armour is part of the family. For him, the quest to discover how it was made is driven not only by personal curiosity, but also the desire to bring its story alive for the people of Australia. But you can't just stick an object on a stand, no matter how important it is, and say to people, look at it, it's interesting. You've got to actually go that little bit further. That's a pretty big adventure. See how it goes. The Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, or ANSTO, is the only place where all the tests can be done under the one roof. Well, you're certainly a long way from Glen Rowan. <laughs> There's a huge team involved with people from ANSTO, the University of Canberra and the National Museum of Australia all doing their bit. We'll work something out. What sort of tests are you planning to do on this? We're going to do neutron diffraction. Should give us an idea of the bulk crystallographic information we're going to do. And, and in English that's actually what? <laughs> it'll tell us the structure of the steel. It'll help us figure out what changes have occurred, how it started out, so that we can basically figure out how they made it. Does it matter how it was made? I mean, wouldn't it be better to leave it as, as, as mysteries and myths or should we actually find out what happened to it? Um, I'm just curious as a scientist. I'd love to know how they made it and what it's made of. That's one of those things, that's why you become a scientist, so you can find out. <laughs> well, let's get it out the box. <laughs> OK. So it's all hands on the armour and it's scattered in every direction as each scientist gets down to the serious business of testing the armour. The first stop for the helmet is the nuclear reactor. Not the sort of place that Joe Byrne probably ever imagined his armour ending up. To understand the internal structure of the metal, the helmet is blasted with neutrons. This will not damage the armour in any way, but it will give them vital clues as to its composition. Here they confirm that it's made from the same type of steel that would have been available in the 1880s. The next stop, this time for one of the side plates, is the X-ray department. So what's this piece of machinery? Um, this is an X-ray diffractometer. And what will this actually tell you about the armour? This will tell us several things. It will tell us uh, what temperature the armour went to, if any of the trace elements have changed it, um, what the starting material was. The key to finding out how the armour was made and who made it is finding out what temperature the metal was heated to. And the X-rays have just uncovered the next clue. It looks like it's only been heated till it's cherry red. But and so does that still mean a, a bush forge or does it mean a, a proper blacksmith out? out we'll, we'll know more once we get some of the information about the carbides because that will tell us the actual temperature it's been to. But, uh... So the next stop is metallography. Here Graham can find out exactly what temperature the metal was heated to by looking at the individual metal crystals. To do this, he has to subject the breast and back plates to a rather intrusive process. He has to grind the surface of the armour down and etch it with acid to reveal the individual metal crystals. He can then take a copy on a piece of plastic to look at under a microscope. Can you separate out what is characteristic of the original ploughshares when the metal was made and what, how those were changed when they fabricated them into a suit of armour? Yeah, the areas I've done, um, some of them, I'm sure, are the original structure. And uh, where it's been worked on, they've got a great variety of results. He's found the heating of the metal was very patchy. In some places, it hasn't been heated enough and bent cold. In other spots, it's been subjected to extended periods in a heat source of about 750 degrees. But after two and a half days of testing and examining, time has run out. The team reassemble to put together what they've found. Is there's a lot of lead and a lot of tin present. Now, that would indicate that this steel, you know, was, was, was recycled. And is the greater heat related to those areas that are more bent than others? That's a 
a possibility because there's more heat on the breastplate than on that backplate. So what was the final conclusion? It is probably very likely that it wasn't made by a blacksmith. Um, it's probably likely that it was made, uh, one description has been a bush forge. Um, Graham seems to think from what he has seen that it got to about 700, 750 degrees C. Um, we need to do a bit more work on that, but it looks, those sorts of temperatures are consistent with a, a fire that you would be able to build in the bush and, and keep fairly hot and then work the metal. So the burning question is, could it have been made by the Kelly gang? Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. It looks like it's been made by people who haven't had the time to sit down and work out how they're going to do it. It's been made in a hurry. If you had been made by a blacksmith and people who weren't worried about being watched and stuff, the craftsmanship would be a lot better. So, yeah, definitely it was made by the Kelly crew. So now the armour has finally told its tale. And it seems that the accepted view of how the armour was made could be wrong. But despite the scientific scrutiny, the Kelly legend lives on. Some people have said, oh, but you're destroying the myth. I don't think we are. I think we're adding to the story.